right, so um, I'm just going to start. Now, the first paper, that the first finding that I am going to share with you, okay, it's from a um, publication by, in the International Journal of Science Education, and that is, am I like a scientist? Primary school students' images of doing science in school. Now, this came from a huge research study, well, not huge, a, a large research study where we actually go into several primary science classrooms uh, across the island that was uh, randomly sampled. And uh, what happened was when we went to the classroom, we looked at how the teachers were teaching. We also talked to the students. Because one of the key hypotheses that we thought we wanted to find out was that if, the, if students were experiencing inquiry in the classroom, they must have a better idea of what science is. And for all of us who are science teachers, the whole idea of doing inquiry is to try to enculturate our students into the way that scientists work. So they must know how scientists work. They have to develop the habits of the mind of scientists. They have to have those epistemic practices that are much desired um, when they learn science. So we wanted to find out after going through uh, science inquiry or science as a form of inquiry, what were some of the ideas of the epistemic practices of science that students have. Okay, so that was what um, uh, motivated this particular study. So how did students view themselves as learners of science? How did they view themselves as learners of science? So I'm just going to pause here for a good 30 seconds and perhaps for you to think about how do you think students view themselves as learners of science? Okay. Think about it, you might want to write it down somewhere. What are your views? Okay. So how did we go about doing this particular study? We actually sampled primary four students, 161 of them, and we adopted the draw a scientist task, which is a very famous uh, uh, methodology that's been around since uh, Chambers time. All right, in the, eight, in the seven, late 70s and 80s, they started to develop this draw of scientists. And we also followed up with some questions and an interview. So the three data sources that we had were draw of scientists, questionnaire, as well as interviews. Now the draw of scientists uh, activity was actually carried out, uh, it used because at primary four, we thought that there could be certain experiences that the students wanted to share, but they were not as fluent uh, in the language yet to be able to describe more complex ideas about learning and about, about science in general. So we got them to draw. We collected all their photographs, I mean, all their drawings, and the research team and I, we sat down and we coded, all right, every single picture, we, every drawing, we coded it to get an idea of what the kids were thinking about. And afterwards, we then went to give them the question air. We also analyzed the question air, and we also had a series of interviews with the students. So what did we find? In this particular study, we actually reported four key ideas, um, four key student ideas of science learning. Firstly, students see science learning as conducting hands-on investigations. Not surprising, right? Simply because many of our classrooms, our primary science classrooms, have um, teachers getting students to do hands-on experimentation hands-on investigation. So students connect hands-on investigation to doing science, uh, uh, learning science and, and uh, uh, to doing science. Secondly, um, students see doing science as learning from the teacher. So they feel that science is, a lot of it must come from the teacher. And therein lies the importance of your role. All right, in your absence, they don't see science as reading from the textbook. Huh? They see science as learning from the teacher. So you have a very important role. The first thing is doing science as completing workbook. So this came out as very important. They associated this with doing workbook because almost every classroom that we went into, the teacher either gave them worksheets or workbooks. So they associate this, uh, science must do workbook. Science must finish worksheet. Okay, so that's the idea of science learning and doing science as a social process. That they also feel that in science, because there are a lot of group work or pair work happening, that learning science, you interact with your peers, you interact with your teachers. 
So these were the four key takeaways that the students had about science learning. This was from their drawings. Based on their drawings, we went one step further and looked at the questionnaire. All right, we looked at the questionnaire. We wanted to find out from the pupils what they perceive from their learning experiences as the most important, as most important for to be successful learners of science and to be successful scientists. And this was one surprising finding. We had top five, we, we rated the top five factors. And um, this one has a chat or not? I think I have. Huh? So I'm just going to pause for a little while and ask you to put in the chat. What do you think was the most important thing that the students thought to be successful science learners? Which factor do you think was most important for them to be successful science learners? You just go on the chat um, and then you can uh, type it up. What do you think students think was so important to be successful science learners? You can go on the chat and type. Completing workbook. Thank you, Pavitra. Learning from the teacher, asking good question. Yes, investigate, complete workbook, recall science facts, do hands on. Pay attention in class. Recall facts, doing science is conducting hands on. Very good. Science experiment, complete workbook. Okay, complete workbook. All of you are very good teachers. I'm so happy you're so familiar with the classroom. So what we found, learning from the teacher, Tony, okay. Thank you all, Drew, and practice of past year paper. Oh, oh, we didn't put that, we didn't get that, but that's probably um, important. Huh? Okay, so what did we find from this particular study? What we found was that the role of good science students to be successful in science, the first one that came out, 94%, that's a very high percentage huh, of the students say they have to be well-behaved. You must be well behaved before you can be a successful science student, okay? And you learn learning for knowledge. The expected role of a science learner is learn for knowledge. Seeking understanding is eight. Applying knowledge is zero, all right? The expected role of a good science student is not to, no need to apply knowledge, but you just need to be well behaved, 94%. Now, this was rather alarming when, when this statistics came out for the research group. So what we did was we actually presented it to the teachers who were working with us in the team. And we said, hey, you know, we've got this. And they go like, oh my goodness. Themselves were like, no, 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 Igling, we need to figure this out. Why is it well behaved? Do you realize that the expected role of a successful science learner is not, nah? is not, I need to be curious. I need to ask questions. I need to uh, be, have perseverance. You know, so all the qualities that we teach them, they didn't appear. This was open-ended. They didn't appear. So we were a bit concerned. Why do they need to be well-behaved? So we went back to the teachers and, um, yeah, Sarah says it depends on what the teachers say in class as well. So we actually went back and we reviewed the videos. We reviewed the videos week after week of the videos that we took in the classroom. And then the teacher said, oh, every time before they start an experiment, they start a hands-on investigation, the teacher said, everybody sit down, keep quiet and listen to me, then we can start. So this happens every single lesson. Every single lesson, the teacher will say, everybody sit down, keep quiet, listen to me, otherwise we are not going to do it. So with time, they do the association, right? You must be well behaved. That's the expected role of a science learner. All right. So I mean, we all understand perfectly. This this data is not to say no. You're doing the wrong thing in class. No, because good behavior management is fundamental for good uh, for for learning to actually take place in the classroom. So the teachers were really um very good in the study. They said, okay, now we understand where what we have done, the consequence of what we have done. We will still do behavior management talk, but can we reduce it? Can we reduce it a little bit and explain the relationship between behavior management talk and science inquiry in the classroom? And I thought that was very positive. All right, and that's important. 
because of this, we also got the kids to tell us what they think are the expected roles of good uh, scientists, right? Science learners, scientists. And this was what we found. Not, not very different in terms of trend, but different in terms of percentages. So they also think that because of this, their science learning experiences, they also think that being well-behaved, scientists that are, who are well-behaved are also, uh, that's the expected role, that scientists need to be well-behaved. Um, so we, 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 initially we were concerned, but after a while we thought about it and we say, these are great four students and these are naive understanding. So, right, because they're only in grade four, right? So hopefully as they progress through their educational journey, they will learn to understand that this may not actually be, be the case. All right, so somebody asked, do students know what scientists does? There's another study uh, that we actually um, also um, try to answer that question. Now, if, a, if by grade four, the students do not know what scientists do, uh, mm, we, need to, we need to plug that hole. All right, because they're learning science. And if they learn science without knowing why, without knowing what a scientist do, we have a big role to play. We need to help them understand that, okay? So the implication for practice here really is uh, the need for teachers to reflect more on behavioral norms, all right? While we are very concerned and we are very, uh, it's important for them to, to uh, obey rules, certain rules in the classroom, um, we want to uh, also balance it. In the inquiry classroom, it cannot always be a behavior talk. Some part of it needs to be attributed to the science behind, to the content of the talk, uh, of the lesson. So students brought up behavioral norms as dimensions of doing science may mean that they have constructed the view that unless they behave well, they will not have access to science and will be invisible outsiders and be left out. Okay, so that's something for, I, I thought I wanted to share this because that's an important aspect for us as practitioners to understand that uh, our decision, our talk, impacts students' ideas about science. In the second paper, we then thought about why, okay, perhaps we want to figure out what are the factors that motivate students' interest in science. Okay, so we, we saw what their ideas about science is, and then now we wanted to find out what their interest is. All right, what will motivate them uh, to learn science? So again, quick, quick poll, what do you think will be factors that affect students' interest in science? Could you just type your very professional uh, uh, hypothesis there? What do you think will be some factors on the chat to get good results? Mm. The experiences in science classroom, the teacher, the teacher factor. Mm. Anything else? Oh, having fun doing experiments, yeah. Peers, curiosity, whether the teacher can inspire love for science, experiment, teacher factor, lesson content, hands-on materials, mm. fun, I, I like to ask questions, able to see the relevance and importance um, beyond the good grades. Friends, lesson content, relate to real life. Hands on, teacher factor, relatable. All right, very good. So many of there were very co many common factors like whether the teacher is able to make the lesson come alive, right? Let, let me share what we have found from our study. So the purpose of this specific study was to investigate ways in which interest in science can be increased in our classrooms. We are doing very good work. In fact, I started out as in the secondary school, but when I saw what was needed in the primary school, I, I went into the primary classroom and I thought, wow, all my colleagues out in primary school, I have a lot of respect for you. It is not easy. It is really, really challenging in the science, primary science classroom. And yet you're doing such excellent work, planning inquiry activities appropriate for uh, the lower grade levels is not an easy thing to do. All right. So a lot of respect for you. So how do science inquiry activities relate to students' interest in science learning? So this was a sample from 425, again, grade four students who responded to a questionnaire. Now, one of the reasons for doing grade four is actually convenience because schools will not let us touch any other levels. 
All right. Um, so they only give us grade four because they say uh, primary three, they just started science, so they, they don't quite understand. Primary four, they've done it one year already. Primary five, primary six, just leave them alone. Okay, so uh, so the poor primary fours are the ones who keep responding to our questionnaire. Um, so after, for example, 425 students, we also sampled 27 students uh, for uh, focus group interviews. And what did we find? The results showed us this. First, efficacy and leisure time science activities was significantly associated with increased interest in school science. Two, uh, self-efficacy and leisure time activities. So self-efficacy just simply means how confident they are of themselves in the subject. How confident they are. All right, so self-efficacy. So we need to work on students' self-efficacy, increase their self-efficacy. Secondly, leisure time science activity. How engaged are they to engage with scientific activities outside of the classroom? So it could be tinkering activities, it could be maker activities, it could be um, a visit to the zoo uh, with their parents, a visit to the science center. So engagement with science related leisure activities, promote interest in science. Secondly, gender was not, is not significantly associated with increased interest in school science. And this was a really interesting finding because in many, when we consulted the international literature, in, uh, gender was always an issue, that girls have lesser interest in science than boys. And so this was a very happy finding. Um, this was a very happy finding because it showed that our local classroom is gender blind, right? You are just a fellow learner with me. Whether it's girl, whether you're a girl or a boy, it does not matter. That's a good thing. That's a good thing, okay? Which is viewed as fun and interesting, like what many of you said, but what we found was that hands-on activities alone was not sufficient to generate interest. It has to be hands-on activities which are coupled with discussion with a knowledgeable others. It must be hands-on activities that are relatable to their real-life experiences. So hands-on activity. On, you need to create a space for discussion to take place, either discussion among their peers or discussion with the teacher, which is you. All right, you must have that because otherwise the hands-on activity, they, they don't know what they have found, the evidence that they have, whether it makes sense or not. All right, so that's a very important finding. Don't just spend all your time on planning hands-on. Plan also for the discussion. So the implication is that Self-efficacy and participation were positively associated. So schools, schools can also involve parents more to we take home kids or science newsletter so that we get the kids engaged with science learning even outside of school. So take home kids could be very simple kids, you know, like um, you can prepare like solubility. You want them to learn about solubility. Give them little plastic vials with uh, sachet of sugar or salt and then gives a little bit of instruction so that they can do with their children over the weekend. So simple materials, science activity for the parents. Some parents want to be involved, but they may not know how. And that's where the school can come in, okay? Um, secondly, during hands-on activity, have the students uh, interact intellectually as well as physically doing their hands-on and minds-on and connect this hands-on activity with peer discussion and connection to everyday life. Now, you, you, we, we keep saying, you know, connect to everyday life, connect to But what does it look like? What, how impactful is that? Okay, so we have to help the children see it. In fact, in one of the interviews where we did with one of the kids, we actually asked the child, we say, hey, you know what? Can you think of after two weeks on uh, the topic of magnets, could you tell us what is what most memorable thing you've learned about magnets? And the child sat there for a good five minutes and thought about it and said, nothing. And we're like, surely there must be something. And the child said, we just put magnet, attack, attack, repair, repel, attack, attack, repel. It's very interesting. So of course the research team cannot leave with nothing as an answer, right? We need some answer, right? So we said, come on, think harder, think harder. And so the child entertain us and say, okay, okay, I'll think harder. And she saw it, she said, ah, yes, there was one thing. And I said, oh, come on, tell us what is it. Remember. 
was that my teacher mentioned that, that the reason why the fridge door could close tight is because it was a magnetic force. There were two pieces of magnet that on the fridge door and that's why it can shut so tight. And I said, oh really, I think that interesting because I realized that there are magnets in electrical appliances. And so she said that she went home and she started to explore all the electrical appliances in her house. And so she wondered which other ones have magnets. So she started to take a magnet and try to figure out which one has magnetic and why? What is the purpose of the magnet in the household item? And I thought that was a bit of the power of, of connecting it to our everyday experiences. All right. Now, everyday experience does not just mean, uh, I think for the younger children, particularly grade four and below, make sure that everyday experiences is something they can relate to. Because we also come across teachers who to say, Hey, you know what, like, I'm relating it to an everyday experience. And I said, yeah, what's that? The Egyptian pyramid. And I said, you know what? I have never seen an Egyptian pyramid myself. Um, I'm not sure if our kids, it, it's a, basically, is it an accessible uh, uh, everyday experience? All right, it may not be. So maybe we want to think about what is really accessible to the child. Okay, so these are important findings from our study. Remember, don't just do hands-on. After that, must have discussion, whether it's with you or with the peers. Next paper was a um, qualitative one, where we look at the social, remember, the four things that students think science learning is, uh, doing science as worksheet, doing science, uh, learning from the teacher, doing science as a social, uh, um, social activity. All right, so here we examine the social interaction during science learning. And for this, we actually use uh, co-generative dialogues. So for those who are familiar with co-generative dialogue, um, uh, you might have done it with your students. This is an idea by Ken Tobin and his team, where they talk about equal uh, agency, giving students agency to voice out their opinion. So in a co-generative dialogue setting, it's about three or five Three to five people where we replay a video. So all of us there has a shared experience of the lesson. All right, and then we play a segment of the video to start a conversation going. And in this co gen dialogue session, the teacher shares her power or her agency with the students in class. So the, teach, the students can say anything they want in the hope to help to improve science learning. And the teacher, you can, you don't, the teacher needs to adopt a a non-defensive stance. You can explain, but you cannot say, no, no, that's not true, that's not true, not like that. Okay, we want to hear the student voices. So in this cogen, a recent question that guided this study was, what do cogenerative dialogues reveal about students' ideas of school science and science learning? Okay, and this is what we found. We, this is how we did it. We had 23 cogenerative dialogue sessions that were recorded and transcribed. And each group of five students, a teacher and a researcher. So we did our open coding. So we started to thematize the ideas that students have. And this is what we found. Results, the interpersonal relations working in a group. Sometimes we put students in groups during science investigation. Agree? Yes. Why do we put them in groups? because there's not enough equipment, right? So, I mean, so those are practical logistical issues, right? We don't have enough. But most importantly, the reason why we put our pupils in groups during science experiment is because scientists work in groups. Scientists do not work alone. Scientists work in teams. And that's what we are trying to recreate in the classroom. All right, we want to enculturate, mimic how scientists actually work. So we put students in groups. So when we put students in groups, we assume they know how to work in groups. Agree? How do you want to think about it? How many of you, when your students come to you and when you want them to work in groups, you actually teach them how to work in groups? You actually explicitly teach them how to work in groups? I believe some of us will do, but not, it's not common. We put them in groups and we said, work in groups. And we're like, what? Now that's a very challenging thing. Even adults find it difficult to work in groups when you each student that pass and you say, okay, now do your work in groups. 
Students will always say, hey, do what? Uh? Do what? Uh? Do what? Uh? Or they adopt a divide and conquer. You do part A, you do part B, you do part C. Uh? Then come together and piece everything together and hand in. What became from a cogent dialogue with the students, these were, there were other issues that were discussed. But what was very, very common and very, um, the students spoke with a lot of passion was this idea of conflict resolution. Students say that in science, when we do hands-on, we are always quarreling. So they remember quarreling very much. And every time we quarrel, we have to spend a lot of time solving problems. So I asked them like, what kind of quarreling do you do? He wants to do, so they have lots of examples. Huh? He wants to do this, she says, he wants to do this and then don't listen to the teacher, blah, 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 blah. So there will always be conflict resolution. And a lot of classroom time is actually spent on resolving these conflicts. Question for us as teachers, are we aware of that? How much time is actually spent on doing the science behind the intention of the lesson? All right, so we need to think about this and teach our kids to work together in groups with little conflict resolution needed. Secondly, the students also learned that there were unequal opportunities among the members in the group. Well, so when they say, you know, the unequal opportunities, there are a, a always gets to do the high class work and I always get to do the low class work. And we were quite tickled. We said, what in the world is a high class work? And what are low class work? So even within the small group in science work, huh, there are there's a class system. So they say, you see. A always gets to use the stopwatch. Always have to hold the thermometer. So being a retort stand is low class work. Being able to use the stopwatch is high class work. So what they do, the role differentiations inside a team is something which the student, um, um, it matters to the student. I don't want to always be the retort stand. I want to be able to manipulate uh, the equipment. All right, so they, they, there are unequal opportunities. So something for us to think about would be, do we want to ensure, how can we ensure that everyone, every child has an equal access to playing with the stopwatch, to manipulating, you know, um, uh, pouring water, looking at the volume, et cetera. Can we ensure that? And last thing was that they felt that in group work, the conversation is dominated by uh, certain specific individuals, typically individuals who are very loud, or individuals who have a lot of um, social reputation. All right, so you 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 have a lot of social. You you are perceived as a very bright kid in class. People will all listen to you. No one wants to listen to the voice of the others. Or um, they certain individuals who are very domineering says um, no. Obey instructions. So the example that was given is was that uh, oh five minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, the example that was given was that you know uh, they were doing the experiment on on friction. What kind of surfaces? You know the ram. So uh, they were the instruction given was you roll down one at a time and you time where it ends. Right, different different surfaces. And then the group because the teachers gave them multiple sets of equipment so that everybody can try. So the boys in the group say, hey, you know what? Why don't we lay all these ramps together and then each of us hold one and we release all at the same time. Then we can all at the same time. Because it's not one at a time. We want to keep that all go. The girl in the group said, no, no, no. And the boys said, why not? The girl said, because it's not in the inspection. And the boy said, but oh, we are modifying it to make it better. And the girl said, no, we're not doing it. And so they didn't get to do it. That because you are more domineering, you win. Uh, so they, they felt all in many instances of this happening, they felt this was not, not a good way to do the project. And in fact, a lot of times they do the lesson rather than do the science. So this is the idea which I want you to take back with you. Are, are you aware of whether the children are doing the lesson or doing the science? Now, one of the things that we observed in group work was that. You know, every time we give them a worksheet, you get them to fill out the, the, the table, right? You collect data. And we always tell them, 
uh, you need to have duplicates or triplicates of your data. And so what happened was uh, we noticed that students actually didn't quite know what data to put. So they did their experiment five times. So they, they only needed to report three, but they didn't know which three to report. And that's how they, they decide eventually. They did a scissors, paper, stone. So they go back to a, a chance. They scissors, paper, stone, whoever wins get to choose a value and put it inside their worksheet. So eventually they fill up the whole group worksheet and they hand it in to the teacher. Now the teacher had no idea. The students didn't know about anomalous results, etc. The teacher had no idea because the students handed in the worksheet. The students had the worksheet, they completed, they did the lesson, but they didn't do the science. They didn't understand the science. All right, so I think those are things which in inquiry science, we teachers need to have a more acute sense of what's actually going on within the group. And, and by repeating ourselves, it doesn't help the situation. I remember one student, we asked, uh, the student keeps saying, you know, my teacher says, they like to quote and unquote you. Huh? My teacher says that we need to repeat the experiment three times. Right? Every teacher says that my daughter comes home and says the same thing. We need to repeat the experiment three times, three times. So the researchers were quite naughty. Yeah? So we asked them, so can we do it five times? And the child said, no, three times only. Teacher said three times. You cannot do it five times. So we, we were amused, but we thought, oh dear, the child did not understand. It's just by pure memory that we teacher say do it three times, but what's the purpose of three times? Don't know. All right. And so I think the implication is we need to emphasize our inclusivity within our group work. And um, we can also use tech, uh, um, um, strategies such as role playing to increase students' empathy to different experiences when they're engaged with group work in science. I think that's an important aspect, particularly with younger children who may not be sufficiently mature to be able to be more inclusive in, in uh, when they are handling uh, apparate manipulatives and their friends and the worksheets, etc. Do some role play with them so that they know how to behave in a group. I think I've got no time already. I don't have a chance to go through the last one, um, but um, that's okay, no worries. Um, the last one was actually the last paper, I think um, for those uh, who are, who are uh, uh, your leaders, you would have heard this presentation uh, um, about uh, understanding students' ideas of inquiry in the classroom. After going through, we don't, they, they are very good at doing inquiry, going through the step-by-step -step process of inquiry, but we wanted to find out whether they understood why, what scientific aspects of scientific inquiry. And so this was study was actually carried out. Um, what we did was we actually sampled 470, pri again, probably four students using an instrument and this is an international study that is conducted in um, 80 uh, economies around the world, uh, trying to compare grade four students' understanding of what scientific inquiry is. And um, yeah, so we found very interesting things like people think, students think that dinosaurs exist today because 1000 year BC, um, the cavemen saw the dinosaur and then the cavemen told the grandchildren, told the children about the dinosaur and the children told their children about the dinosaur. And so until today, we know what we know that dinosaurs exist. So for them, it was not about fossils. It was about oral history. All right. So oral history, that's why we knew what happened many years ago. That was one perspective. OK, so I thought we were we, we laughed at this. But my colleague said, Ikling, if we don't let students do inquiry, if we don't let students experience science that it is, science become oral history for the kids. Because if all of us here only go into the classroom and tell them, this is what scientists found, this is what happened, this is what happened, science is an oral history. If you don't get to test it out, we have failed. All right, so I think I should end here.